We're continuing to look at some of the characters that Jesus encountered on the way to the cross. Some of those were probably expected ones. This one probably isn't as expected. It's the story of a woman who was caught in adultery. And our symbol for this morning is the rock that you see hanging over there off the cross. Please don't walk under that. I'm not sure how secure it is. So you do not want to be the next person stoned with that. Our text is from John chapter 8, and it's the first 11 verses. There's only 11 verses in this story giving us all of the information that we would have on this woman, on her encounter with Christ, and really what it means for us. So let's take a look at those first eight verses, actually beginning with chapter 7, verse 53. Then each went to his own home. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And at dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered round him. And he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, and they made her stand before the group. And they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And in the law of Moses, it commands us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing Jesus. But Jesus bent down, and he started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left left with a woman still standing there. And then Jesus straightened up and he asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now and leave your life of sin. May God bless this reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, open your word for our understanding. Not only that we may know, but that in believing, it may change our hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're going to look at shame this morning. Shame is one of those emotions that can debilitate us. It's not guilt. Guilt is what we know in our actual actions. Shame is then the, re- the emotional response to that. Let me give you a couple definitions of shame. A painful emotion caused by consciousness of guilt. When we know our shortcomings, our improprieties then this painful emotion kicks in. It is a condition of humiliating disgrace or disrepute, or it is something that brings censure and reproach and regret. Some would say that we learn shame very early. Some would say that in this nature-nurture kind of environment, that it's one of these things that even at Nash's young age, is already there and just needs to develop. Others would say, no, it's all cultural. We learn how to feel shame. And however we come about that, there is no denying that shame affects all of us. 
I think we've all probably had a situation where we felt shame within our lives. Something that we did, something that we heard, something that we said, something that we caused to take place. And not only did we have the guilt, but then we began to feel the shame. And it's that heavy weight of emotion that kind of pushes down on us and makes the guilt even heavier than what it actually is. It's a way for our culture to kind of keep all of us in line. But whether it is something that God placed there at the beginning or something that we learn, either way, shame is part of who we are. We're going to hear a couple stories this morning. The first one I want to share with you, um, if you remember not too long ago in the news, there were two Australian DJs who made a call to the hospital where Kate Middleton, well, not Kate Middleton anymore, Princess Kate, was there because of a difficult pregnancy. And they thought it would be a real joke in order to be able to get a hold of the hospital staff and be able to get through, and so they posed as the queen. And they did this, and the nurse who was there answering the phone believed them, believed that it was the queen, and actually gave information about Kate's condition. And if you remember the story, two days later, she committed suicide. She died of shame. In fact, her family said the tragedy in all of this is that the royal hospital hoax caused the lives of this 45-year-old mother of two by shame. She couldn't handle the shame, the weight of that. The guilt was one thing. She knew that what she had done, even though probably not her fault, brought guilt but it was the shame that killed her. The backlash, of course, after that was immense. When the world got wind of all of that, when they began to respond, I'm sure there were a lot of fingers that were wagging. How could they do this? How cruel a hoax. What were they thinking? Perhaps that's part of it. When shame takes place, very often it's because we aren't thinking, isn't it? We put it aside. We don't respond. This 45-year-old nurse was the light and the provider of her family. And that was God. We want to hear about another woman whose life was touched in a very significant way this morning. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not that the woman in this story is innocent like the last one. But she's touched by the shame nonetheless. And that shame, shame is one of those reproductive savants. It is just tremendous at reproducing itself. And once there's a little bit of shame, it's easier the next time to have even more and then more and then more. And there seems to be an abundance of that until we become debilitated and can't move and can't get out of it. Shame can run as deep and as public as the Grand Canyon. It can manifest itself in the echoes of the screams of the people that are around us. Or it can be as silent as the imagined fingers that are pointing at us. Rumors that are going about. So it can be either public out there or it can be very private on the inside. But either way, it can be the destroyer of lives. Lives. 